Tonight's speaker is Natalie Kelly. You may have heard of Natalie. She is Chief Research Officer at Common Sense Advisory. She's been in the language services industry since 1996. She's fluent in Spanish and English and has also studied French, Italian, German, Arabic, and Japanese. She's a former Fulbright Scholar in Spanish, Spanish sociolinguistics and has studied in Ecuador, Ireland, and the United States. She is author of Telephone Interpreting, the first book ever written on the topic, and Found in Translation, How Language Shapes Our Lives and Transforms the World. So again, if you could uh, hold your questions till the end, we'll have Natalie up here to speak. My Twitter handle is at Natalie Kelly, N-A-T-A-L-Y-K-E-L-L-Y. And the handle for the book is at XL8Book, that's XL number eight, B-O-O-K. <laughs> so thank you very much, Joe, for inviting me here, and thanks to Anne uh, from Google and all of you for coming out today. Um, I'm going to talk about something uh, that I normally don't get to talk about, I mean, normally I'm talking about common sense advisory research, and today I'm actually going to talk about a book that I've written with Yost Secha, who is my co-author, and the book is called Found in Translation, and the subtitle is How Language Shapes Our Lives and Transforms the World. And it's not just a subtitle, this really means something, and I'm going to explain why we chose that subtitle throughout my talk. So a lot of people, when they think of translation, think about academic exercises and think about literary translation. And if they think about interpreting at all, they tend to think about conference interpreting. Now, how many of you speak another language other than English? Almost everybody. Wonderful. Can I get you to shout out on the count of three the languages that you speak? Ready? One, two, three. Ooh, and I heard somebody who's still, still uh, counting off the languages back there. <laughs> Excellent. So we have a pretty multilingual group here today. And how many of you have done translation work? Please raise your hand. And how many of you have done paid translation work? Professional translation work. How many of you are full-time professional translators? And how many of you work in translation, localization, internationalization today? Okay, great. So many of you are familiar with some of the concepts that I'm going to be talking about today and some of the stories that I'll be sharing. But I'm pretty sure there will be other stories that you haven't heard yet that come from the book. And hopefully it will open up your mind to how big this field is and how incredible the field of translation really is. So the first point that I really want to make is that translation shapes our lives. That's from the subtitle of the book. And I don't just mean the people who work in this field. I mean everybody's life. Translation affects every single person in the world. That's my premise. So I'm going to give you some stories that come from the book that show exactly how translation shapes our lives. So the first story is about this word, intoxicado. Now, how many of you speak Spanish? A good number of people speak Spanish. Excellent. So I'm sure all of you know how to translate this term perfectly, right? <laughs> it's a tricky one. So those of you who speak Spanish, don't give me the answer, please. <laughs> Those of, you who don't, those of you who don't speak Spanish, looking at that word, you probably think that it means intoxicated, right? So there was a bilingual nurse in a Florida hospital in the year 1980. And this bilingual nurse heard the patient came in and his family said he was intoxicado. So how did he render that word into English? He said, he's intoxicated. There's just one problem. It doesn't mean intoxicated. Now, this is a pretty difficult word to translate on its own. I can give you some examples and you can help me figure out the meaning. So intoxicación por plomo means lead poisoning. Intoxicación por alimentos, food poisoning. Intoxicación solar, sun poisoning. So how do you translate the word intoxicado? He's intoxicado. Yeah, but do we say in English that somebody's poisoned? We really don't say that, do we? We say they have food poisoning or they have some poisoning. So it just goes to show how difficult it is to translate a single word like that. Now in this case, what happened was that he was given the wrong course of treatment because of this mistranslated word. And a healthy young man became quadriplegic. 
Shortly after, a lawsuit followed, and the $71 million settlement was the result of this mistranslation as well. So this is often known as the $71 million word. Right. So there are consequences to mistranslating a single term, consequences that are important in terms of the human value as well as the economic and financial <coughs> repercussions. Let me give you another example that also comes from the book. So this is an example of something that happened in Haiti, January 12, 2010. We remember what happened then. This was when the earthquake took out most of the communications. Now we have a special guest with us today. Rob, would you mind standing up? So Rob is a researcher and uh, developed a very impressive system that was able to use the only form of communication that was available when all other forms of communication went down. These were text messages or SMS messages. So the system that Rob created in his work as a researcher at Stanford was called Mission 4636. And this system allowed him to gather more than 1,000 volunteers in 49 countries. And because of this system, in the first six weeks after the earthquake, or after the program was launched, there were more than 40,000 messages that were translated in 10 minutes or less, all via text message. Now you might think, well, why would these text messages matter? The rescuers who were rescuing people on the ground spoke different languages. Many of them were coming through international aid and relief organizations. So in order for them to reach people, in order for them to find out what was wrong, give them life-saving treatment, help them find shelter, help them find safety, those translations really mattered. They saved human lives. They saved hundreds of lives. So the work that Rob did and the work that all those volunteer translators did had a tremendous impact on human life. But if you're not convinced yet that translation shapes your life, I'll give you another example. Because so far, I've shown you how translation affects other people's lives. So you might be asking, well, how does it affect me? Tell me about me. I care about me. <laughs> so here's an example for you. The Global Public Health Intelligence Network, also known as GFIN, is mining constantly global news reports and using automatic translation technology to translate articles from English and into, into and out of English and eight other languages. So this is machine translation, automatic translation. Now what you might not know about this system is that swine flu and SARS, the first cases, were detected by this particular system. What it's doing is scanning for important keywords, for symptoms, for things like fever, for things like sneezing, for some of these symptoms that are the first indicators of a public health outbreak. So the system issued alerts in those cases and the response and containment efforts followed. So this goes you to show that translation is behind the scenes, keeping us safe, preventing public health outbreaks from spreading. How else does translation shape our lives? If you're not convinced yet, I'll give you another compelling example. On September 10th, 2001, the day before the 9-11 attacks, there were some warnings that were caught, warnings that were issued about what was about to happen. So the words, tomorrow is zero hour, and the words, the match is about to begin, were intercepted. These were recorded and intercepted from Al-Qaeda operatives by US intelligence agencies. Now there was just one problem. These messages were not in English. They were in Arabic. So when do you think they were translated? September 12th. 2001. And it's not to say that if these had been translated on the day that they were intercepted, that the 9-11 attacks would have necessarily been prevented. Obviously, a lot has to happen for something to be considered a credible threat, and a lot of wheels have to be put in motion. But it does go to show the importance of not only translation, but translation that happens quickly, translation that can happen efficiently, systematically. So this comes from official US government documents. Anyone can look up this information. And there, it's a well-known fact that the US government has had a backlog, tremendous backlog of translation that hasn't been carried out. And this is a constant struggle that the US government officials are still facing. 
So what happens when countries go to war? How does translation play a role then? Well, translators and interpreters are constantly being used when countries come into conflict with each other. This is a, a picture of a man who everybody needs to know. Everybody watching needs to know and remember the name of this man. He is one of the true heroes of the interpreting profession. His name is Peter Less. Now, Peter Less was an interpreter at the Nuremberg trials, where the Nazi war criminals were tried. Peter had the difficult task of rendering testimony and rendering the words of some of the masterminds of the Holocaust. And this was even more difficult in his case because he was a Holocaust survivor himself. In fact, his entire family, his parents, his siblings, his grandmother, were killed in Auschwitz. So he had to be the voice of the people who were responsible for these atrocities. Can you imagine how difficult that must have been? But yet, he was able to stand to that task and to carry it out heroically. So he is a name who I hope we will always think of when we think of why translation matters in the world. And again, you may say, this doesn't affect me, this is all about other people. But when we think about access to justice and we think about carrying out the, le the, thing, the proceedings in the legal system, translation truly does affect all of us. If any of us is a victim of a crime and the only witness speaks a language other than English, do we want to deny them an interpreter? Absolutely not. Even the most pro-English only person would want that, that person to be able to state what happened if they were a victim. So I think it highlights the importance of translation in our world. But I'm not done. I'll give you another example. This is another woman who I would love you to know. Her name is Maria Clara Charupihua, and she is from the Shuar indigenous group in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And she is a poet, and she's here in this picture reading some of her poems. And she writes poems in Shuar and in Spanish, and I am I am very privileged to be her translator, to translate her poetry into English. Now you may think, why should I care, Natalie, about a translator of a language that is in the Ecuadorian Amazon? How does this affect me? Well, it does affect you. Because one in every four ingredients in pharmaceutical products come from the Amazon rainforest. And only between 10 and 20 percent of the plants in the Amazon rainforest have been categorized. So many of the secrets of healing and powers of curing diseases are locked up in languages like the one that she speaks. So if there is a cure for AIDS, for cancer, for diabetes, for a lot of the ails of society, ailments, chances are they're there in the Amazon and they're locked up in languages that translation has the power to unlock. So hopefully I've convinced you now that translation affects your lives. Now I'd like to try to convince you that translation can be found pretty much everywhere. And this is where things start to get exciting. So right now, there is actually a conference going on in, in San Diego at the American Translators Association. And the American Translators Association has about 11,000 members. There are about 2,000 people there. And I just was looking on their conference website at some of the sessions that are happening right now. So we have sessions going on right now that deal with German accounting standards, patent abstract translation in French, interpreting proverbs and idioms in Korean, criminal terminology in Brazil, slang and taboo for the courts, translating and interpreting war crimes trials for Bosnia and Ser Serbia and Croatian, translating sexist and gender neutral language, Things like understanding the clinical trials that you're translating and the science behind it, subtitling motion pictures, <coughs> translating for design and construction in Israel, advancing productivity using voice recognition, and one of my personal favorites, building your own statistical machine translation systems. Very interesting that there is a session on this to, to teach translators how, how to build their own systems. So you can see that translation is in all kinds of different places. And in the book, we talk about translation of Harlequin romance novels, something lighthearted. But translation 
also of holy books and sacred texts, which isn't so lighthearted, much more serious topic. Translators and interpreters are used in outer space by astronauts to communicate with engineers on the ground who speak other languages. And on another lighthearted note, if you go to the opera, you might be handed a libretto that has been translated so that you can understand what it says. Translators are out there helping come up with the exact wording for peace treaties so that both sides will agree to them. And they're also translating video games. And translators are also enabling us to use social media platforms, which can be used for fun and also for more serious things, like revolutions, enabling people to connect, enabling people to communicate and organize. So my next important point that we make throughout the book is that translation isn't easy. And everybody who, here who's done that can probably attest to the fact that that's true. So a lot of people who are working in this field have this question. Well, if I'm bilingual, can I become a translator? <laughs> We've all been asked that, right? But the best way to answer that question, I think, is that not everybody who knows how to write can be a professional writer. Just because you cook dinner every night doesn't make you a professional chef. Just because you drive a car doesn't make you Mario Andretti. <laughs> the same thing is true for translators. Just because you know two languages does not make you a professional translator. And the proof that we also have to offer people that translation isn't so, isn't so easy is that when people take professional translation exams, the passing rates are usually very low around 20% for most exams, for translators and interpreters. So if eight out of 10 bilingual individuals who are failing these tests, that goes to show that it takes more than just fluency in two languages to be a translator. The reason for that is because, of course, words can be tricky. They can be misunderstood. They can be misconstrued. They can be taken out of context. And that's just in one language. All we have to do is just think of the classic telephone game, where one person whispers to the next, to the next, to the next, and by the end of it, we get a completely transformed message, and that's just in one language. Language also never stops evolving. It is completely unique to each person. You know, my husband sent out an email blast to a bunch of people to let them know about the book, and he wrote, apologies for the spousal spam. <laughs> and I thought, oh, a new term. Okay, where did he get this? So I asked him, you know, where did you hear that? And he said, oh, we just made it up. That's just one example of human creativity. We come up with new terms all the time. We coin new terms all the time. And that's why humans are so necessary for translation. But when we think about spoken language, it's much more complex. Obviously, we have things like tone of voice to worry about. We have accent and pronunciation. We even have things like volume levels. And of course, translation of spoken language, interpretation, is affected by other things that aren't necessarily within our control. So we have the equipment that we're using. We have less predictable things like background noise, interference. Even if someone has a sore throat, that can affect our ability to comprehend them. So there's all these other variables that can interfere with an interpreter's ability to render information accurately. So when we start to talk about more than one language, you know, we say in the book that languages are like different instruments. They have different scales. They have different sounds. Sometimes they don't even have the same notes. You can't physically play the same note in the same range or the same octave in, on one instrument as you can on another. So we actually wrote in the book that poetry translation is like playing a piano sonata on a trombone. And I really think that's true because I'm currently trying to translate some poetry that was originally written in Schwad, and to get that to come into English is a pretty mighty challenge. I would also say it's not just poetry translation that presents this problem. You know, how many of you saw in the recent debates the uh, Romney quote that's been everywhere, binders full of women? <laughs> okay, how do you translate that? <laughs> it's not so easy to translate, so I wonder how this was translated in the news for international media. But to make it even more complicated, after this all came out, I saw an image that was shared, and it had Beyonce, and it said, if you like it, then you better put three rings on it. <laughs> and it was referring to a three-ring binder, and I thought, this is a translator's nightmare. Because not only do you have to know something about Beyonce, you have to know something about current events in American politics. 
You have to know about gender relations and, and these things that are happening in the, in the news with regard to women and women's rights. And you have to know that in the United States, people use three ring binders, which aren't necessarily used in every country. Other countries have two ring binders or four ring binders or six ring binders. So it's very complicated to try to migrate that concept and that humor, especially into another language. Termin terminology knowledge is another reason that translation is difficult. The average person uses about four to 5,000 words in English on a regular basis. People who are educated, who've received a basic education, know between eight and 10,000 words. The prof professions that use the widest vocabularies use more than double that amount of words. So how many words do you think translators have to know? Well, many of them are crossing many disciplines, and many are going into more than one language. So they obviously have to know this kind of vocabulary in at least two languages. So to give you another example of why translation is so difficult, I thought I would show you this. So numbers don't need translation, right? You can just transfer them across languages with no problem, right? <laughs> Does anyone know what these numbers have in common, aside from the fact that they're on signs in these images? How about if I show you this? Does anyone want to volunteer to take flight 666 and sit in seat number 13? <laughs> These are bad luck numbers in this culture, right? But they might not be bad luck numbers in every culture. And all the numbers up here are bad luck in some culture. So you can't just transfer these numbers when you're translating a marketing campaign, an advertising campaign, or maybe even a flight number. To give you another example of how difficult translation can be, I thought I would tell you this little story about President Carter. So President Carter, when he was in office, became accustomed to working with interpreters. And after he left office, he went to Japan, and he was ta giving a talk at a school. And since he had worked with interpreters many times throughout his career, he thought, OK, I'm going to use a joke, but I know it's really hard to interpret jokes. So I'm going to make it short. I'm going to keep it as a pretty easy, short joke. So he told this joke, and the audience erupted in laughter after the interpreter rendered it into Japanese. They just died laughing. And he thought, wow, this is the best response I've ever had to a joke. I wonder what the interpreter's secret is. So he went up to the interpreter and asked, and at first she didn't want to say. But then he asked again, and the interpreter said, Mr. President, I told the audience, President Carter told a funny story. Everyone must laugh. <laughs> Made the interpreter's life easier. It isn't easy to translate humor, even if you're a professional interpreter. So you can see how hard translation and interpreting can be. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the future. I believe that translation is going to lead us into a new era. What do I mean by that? So I started to look in history for other professions that have made a dramatic impact on the world. And one of the professions that came up was this guy here, blacksmiths. So in a certain time period, blacksmiths were seen kind of like magicians. They could do magical things. They could transform metal, a hard surface, and soften it and make it look beautiful and do really important things with it. In fact, many people in villages would come to them and they were doing all kinds of things, not only creating every single nail, and it's hard to imagine we couldn't just go buy a box of nails, each one had to be handcrafted, but they were doing things like dental work and veterinary work and all kinds of things, even warming the bread and baking the bread for the villages because they were some of the few people who knew how to keep fires going. So blacksmiths played a very important role, and they're, much like translators, their work touched all different aspects of society. They were actually the linchpin of progress for the Industrial Revolution. As needs became more complex, so did the skills that were needed by blacksmiths. And they were actually involved in helping build the machines that would eventually replace their role. And they gave rise to a new way of life, a new economy, a new society, a whole new way of life. 
And that role actually evolved into many other professions that did not exist previously in history. So things like welders, machinists, pipe fitters. And there were also a lot of black, blacksmiths that went on to invent great things using their skills and their knowledge, like Studebaker, John Deere, Henry Ford. These were all blacksmiths. So even after their role was transformed, they continued to make major contributions. So I want to talk, I'm going to come back to the idea of blacksmiths and translators and what they have in common. But the question that you're probably asking is, because blacksmiths kind of faded away, does that mean translators are also going to fade away? Well, here's where I think there is a difference between what blacksmiths did and what translators are doing. So the big question is that everybody asks me all the time is, will human translators be replaced? I think when you compare them to blacksmiths, you can ask people to use identical nails. You can standardize things like railroad ties. But can you ask people to use identical words? Can you ask everybody to speak the same way? Can you ask people to mass produce content? Can it be like a factory assembly line? How much content can be mass produced and how much has to be customized. So let's take a look at what some of the data says. So some of the stats I'm going to show you here come from Common Sense Advisory. So the market today is worth more than 33 billion US dollars, the market for language services and technology. That's as of 2012. And the market is growing at a rate of 12.17%. Now the market has continued to grow steadily throughout the recession. Unlike many industries, this market has continued to grow. Now, the growth did slow down a bit during the global economic downturn, but it continued to grow, and historically has always grown yearly in double-digit growth rates. There are more than 26,000 translation agencies or companies offering translation services throughout the world. And our estimates tend to be pretty conservative compared to some of the other government estimates that are out there. So. North America is not the only important area of the world when it comes to translation. In fact, it's not even the biggest. Europe is quite a bit larger. And North America makes up less than a third. But translation is a global industry, as you can see here. And the dynamics and the distribution of how this market is changing are different every single year that we look at it. Asia is rising. We're seeing North America play less of a role than in the past. So these things are changing year by year. But this market is made up of many, many services, not just translation. Obviously, software localization, which a lot of you are interested in, on-site interpreting, website globalization, multimedia localization, all of these are encompassed within this broader market. But translation is by far the biggest service because it's used by pretty much every type of organization that you can think of. Demand for translation is growing. We did a study of Fortune 500 companies and the vast majority told us that their translation volumes have increased and that they expect them to continue to increase. Their content volumes were increasing at an even faster pace. So the potential demand for translation is enormous. Some studies show that there are 2.5 quintillion bytes of data, of information coming into existence every single day. Translation providers are converting a tiny, tiny fraction of that, 0.00000067%. That's how much they are converting every day. So if even just a tiny fraction of that information is useful for translation purposes, that signifies enormous potential for translation. What a lot of people don't realize when they talk about machine translation replacing humans is that human translators already use translation software and translation technology. An idea of leveraging past content is already widespread. This is something that has existed for decades. So the average translation agency translates about 43,000 words per day. And freelancers have an average of little less than 2,700 words per day. We asked freelancers and translation agencies how many words are brand new words translated for the first time without using any translation memory software. The rate for both was almost identical. It's about 60%, which means that 40% of what they're translating is using translation memory, is relying on past translation work that's already been done in the past. So when we talk about technology replacing translation, think about these figures. Technology already is helping replace about 40% of the human translation work that used to be done in the past. 
It's just being done by a slightly different technology than automatic translation. So is technology going to replace human translators? This is a question we get asked all the time. And I always ask, has accounting software made accountants obsolete? Has medical diagnostic software made doctors obsolete? Has legal software made lawyers obsolete? So why do we think that translation software would make translators obsolete, especially when we've been using translation software for decades? That's a question that I think all of us should ask. These fields are constantly evolving, and so is the field of translation. And as I mentioned, those 26,000 companies, they're not just made up of translators. They're made up of salespeople. They're made up of marketing directors. They're made up of software engineers. They're made up of all kinds of people, human resources staff. Many, many people are employed in this industry. It's not just translators that would have to be replaced. Language is categorized as the epitome of human intelligence. So how many of you are familiar with the Turing test? Many of you. So the Turing test looks at the machine's ability to use language as a human would. And this is considered to be the ultimate test of whether machines can uh, have human intelligence. So the questions that we can ask ourselves when it comes to can a machine replace a human translator? Can a machine use language like a human can? Can a machine debate politics? Can a machine write poetry? Can a machine flirt with someone? Can a machine tell jokes? In just one language, can a machine do any of those things? Maybe we can get to a point where a machine can do some of those things in one language, but we're not just dealing with one language. We're dealing with thousands of languages. So the answer that we need to remember when, we ask a, you know, when we're asked this question of can machines replace humans in translation, is that we still have a long way to go, a really long way. Google Translate is available today in 65 languages plus English. But there are between six and 7,000 languages in the world today. And there's just one big problem when it comes to thinking about extending Google Translate into all of those languages. Only 2,261 have writing systems. The rest of them are spoken or signed. There are hundreds of sign languages. There are 18 in Latin America alone. So written translation is really not enough. It's hardly sufficient. The majority of the languages are spoken or signed. So even if we could address all of those issues, and we can imagine that we can do automatic translation for spoken and written and signed language in all of those languages, there's one more problem. We would have to hit a big pause button on human language development. We say, freeze everybody. No more jokes. No more plays on words. No more new invented terms. Everybody has to stop. And we are going to mine all text ever produced in every single language. And we are going to analyze all language variations currently spoken by every human being on Earth. And then we're going to translate it into and out of 6,000 to 7,000 languages that exist throughout the world. As soon as we hit that play button again, the need for human translators returns. So this is an image of a blacksmith that I took just a couple years ago in a very small town in rural Illinois, near where I grew up, in New Salem, which is a Lincoln heritage site. And this is a working blacksmith. I was surprised to learn that there are still about 11,000 working blacksmiths in the United States today, similar to the number of professional translators that are members of the American Translators Association. Now, not all of them are full-time blacksmiths that are paid to do that work. And a lot of what they're doing is custom work, custom forging for you know, making little brackets to hang curtains and doorknobs and things like that. A lot of that work is very artisanal, very specialized, very customized. But some of them do still exist. As I mentioned, many of, many of the blacksmiths at this field evolved, the profession evolved, just like the profession of translation is evolving. But some still do this work the very same way that it was done many, many years ago. So do translators really have anything in common with blacksmiths? Well, translators don't work in total isolation, like I mentioned. They're not separate 
from all of these other jobs. They are part of an ecosystem, part of a community. And it's unlikely that we will ever be able to mass produce content the way that you can mass produce a box of nails in a standard way. And as I mentioned, 40% of current translation work leverages past work already. So if we are in a process of replacing human translators, we're already in the midst of that process. 60% of the work that translators are doing today still entails custom forging, if we want to use the blacksmith metaphor. So this profession is already in the midst of evolving. So are translators the new blacksmiths? Well, I believe that much like blacksmiths pushed us into the industrial age, into the industrial revolution, translation is pushing us past the information age. And we are moving now into the information transformation age. Whatever shape the next revolution we have takes, a lot of people have referred to this as the information revolution, translation has to play a part. We can't talk about access to information unless we talk about translation, unless we talk about the language component. So translation will be critical in helping us achieve a better quality of life. Now, we did a study recently at Common Sense Advisory on the need for translation in Africa, and this was a study that was commissioned by Translators Without Borders. And we were surprised to see that so many respondents told us that translation would affect virtually every aspect of their life, political inclusion, health information, information about how to prevent conflict. People even said that they thought it would reduce, more access to translated information would reduce violent conflict. They also said that it would prevent the loss of life of loved ones. Just having information to basic, access to basic information about how to prevent certain health concerns and health conditions would have had a tremendous impact. So when we think about the Industrial Revolution, how it led us to a new quality of life, I truly believe that translation for many people who don't have much access to information, especially in their native languages, can definitely impact their lives. We have data that shows us this. I don't think that content is king anymore. I believe that the ability to transform content, to intelligently use that information, to customize it, is truly the new king, or maybe queen. Speaking of kings, I was looking for stories and information about blacksmiths, and I came across this story about King Arthur. So King Arthur summoned all the artisans and asked them to explain why their work was important to building Camelot. He asked them to justify their position. So he brought in the tailor, he brought in the carpenter, he brought in the stonemason, the goldsmith, and other artisans. And each of them made a very strong case to him for why their work was important. And he asked them, where they got their tools, and each one of them said, the blacksmith. So Arthur asked the blacksmith, and who makes your tools? And the blacksmith said, sire, I make my own tools. That is my craft. And remember that American Translators Association session that I pointed out, where translators are being taught to create their own statistical machine translation engines? Talk about making your own tools. Is that our craft? Is that the craft of translators for the future? And the kindly king moved the humble blacksmith to the head of his table, as he had made all the tools for all the trades. I truly believe that translators are in the process of making their own information tools, whether that is contributing to their own translation memory databases or simply producing translations that are being mined by statistical machine translation engines. And these are tools that can truly open up a door to human rights and to a civilization that we can't even describe today. We haven't even imagined what it will be like for so many people who don't have access to information and can't understand what it's like to benefit from that information in a language that they can truly understand. So I've told you about the book and the fact that I believe that translation not only shapes our lives and transforms the world, but I also believe that translation truly defines our future. I think when we talk about access to information, we really have to think about access to information as a human right. And until we can unlock that information for those six to 7,000 languages, we truly are not providing equal access to everybody who needs it. 
So that's why I believe translation matters, and that's why I believe it will have an important effect on the way we live our lives, not only today, but in the future. So with that, I will be happy to take your questions. And we'll have I have, so I, I think I, I want to put together a couple thoughts because you covered a lot of ground, but um, the 6,000 to 7,000 languages, um, I think that includes a fair number of dead and archaic languages? No, those are all languages that are spoken, but many of them are endangered. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the statist also, the statistics that are based on the volume of translation, a lot of that is driven by the amount of content that's being translated, not necessarily the demand, because I think most of us in this room know that we have a number of companies that like to just translate whatever they've got and don't always pay attention to the quality of their content and so forth. Um, I see pressure in uh, many countries, China, India, as a part of solving, and, and also in Africa, solving their literacy issues and their communication issues by moving towards, well, first education, but then also standardization and, and centralization of their population's ability to speak fewer languages, moving in that direction. So uh, between that and the number of languages that are dying every year, um, it would seem that there's also a trend that is, is somehow ignored in your, in, in your discussion of having actually fewer working languages in the world o over time. Not that translation would go away, but you can't just use the numbers that are based on content and, and costs, uh, cost demand. So I wonder if you'd address some of those points. Sure. So this is a common question that we're asked a lot. You know, are global languages taking over and making some of those you know, language number 2,497 and so on, less important because more, people, more people can use an interlanguage, you know, one of these large global languages. What is happening is that a lot of communities now can communicate much more easily than they could in the past. So yes, there is a push for literacy, even in languages that don't have a writing system. And there's this, there's this in my view, archaic desire to force literacy on, upon people, when in some cases, that's not that necessary. If they can communicate with video-based, audio-based information, why do they need to be forced to have a writing system? You know, maybe it's better to use audio and video information where a lot more nuance and a lot more information, it's much richer information to begin with. So maybe they can skip that step. You know, it used to be that writing was very important because that was a fast way to disseminate lots of information. But now, we can do the same thing much more efficiently in a lot of ways with video information. So one thing that we do at Common Sense Advisory is look at the stats of languages on the web and which ones are becoming more important. Every year we do a, a large-scale study on this. And one thing that we're noticing is that these less common languages are becoming more and more important each year and we have that long tail of languages effect that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So. Yes, there are efforts in many countries to standardize and there are efforts to kind of go toward um, one language, gravitate toward a language of power, a language that is traditionally uh, the language of, of people in society that are usually the ones who hold the resources. But there are also a lot of efforts to preserve native languages and to allow people to use the language that's most familiar to them. So I don't think that that trend is going to go away. I think it's only going to increase because all of the companies, you know, I know many of you work for large global companies, and who are you competing with when you're going into some of those markets? You're competing with local competitors for the most part, and a lot of them are founded by people who speak some of those minority languages, and many of them will have bilingual websites and uh, websites in some of those languages. So every country is slightly different, of course, with regard to their language policy and with regard to their preferences and, you know, with regard to who's in power at the moment. But I see a lot of small languages fighting, and I see a lot of them creating content. You know, and really, if they have the operating systems to be able to create content, that is what is opening the door for them to be able to do that, at least in a digital fashion. So I'm not sure I answered your question exactly, but 
It's a complicated one. <laughs> you have a follow-up? Natalie, oh, um, no, he's lost the mic. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Natalie, th thank you for Thanks, that presentation. Thanks. It was very thoughtful and uh, actually elegant, uh, in my opinion, so thank you. Um, my question is about uh, the term translator. Um, when you talk about translator, um, can you give us some thoughts on community? Is it an individual person? Is it a community? Um, and what do these generative, creative types, what's the profile? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a complicated question. Um, I just wrote an article on this exact topic about how translators are defining themselves. And the reality is even the lay public will call an interpreter a translator. And even someone who works in transcreation is usually referred to as a translator, even if what they're doing really isn't translation. So the word translation, you know, I've used this term in this presentation because I have been using the overarching term, you know, related to transferring information from one language to another. And that's the basic definition that you'll find in most dictionaries. Um, what we're finding is, in some of the studies that we're doing at Common Sense Advisory, is that this word and what it means is changing drastically. So we just did a recent study on pricing, and the big finding was that the price of translation, average price of translation has dropped. Nobody likes to hear that. Don't shoot the messenger. Well, maybe some people do like it if you're buying a translation, but nobody on the supply side likes to hear that. But what we found is that the reason for that is that this field is becoming more diverse. So now, it, it used to be many years ago, if you bought translation by the word, you would get translation, editing, and proofing, including in the price per word, included in that. Now, if you buy translation, you're only getting translation from a lot of vendors. And you're separately paying for editing, and you're separately paying for proofing, and you're separately paying for translation memory management, and you're separately paying for hosting your translation memory files in, perpet in perpetuity. You're separately uh, paying for terminology management. You're separately paying for project management. Many of these things are being broken up now. So the field is getting more diverse in many senses, and buyers are starting to pay separately for that. So it's not necessarily that the price is dropping on average. It's that many more things are being built in, were, used to be built into that price per word that aren't anymore. So a lot, there's a lot that goes into that word translation. And uh, we're tracking that. And we actually are doing a study on production models to see how different language service providers are managing that process. And now we're starting to see more collaborative forms emerge. You know, I talked to a language service provider the other day, and they told me that they don't have a TEP process, a translate edit proof process. What they're doing is they have two translators who work together. Neither, there's no hierarchy. They're a pair, kind of like pair programming, and they're pair translating. They're truly pair translating and working as a team and translating together. And so they both have to be comfortable with the output. They both have to be comfortable with the quality, but it saves them the quality assurance steps mm -hmm because they're doing it from the start and they're doing it together and they're allowing collaboration. And all of you are probably familiar with crowdsource translation, community translation. We've written a ton about that. That's another form that's less common, but is still a form of, that is changing the way we view translation. Yes. Um, my, sorry. Uh, my name is Mike. Thank you for your time. And it was a very interesting presentation. Um, I just have a quick question. It's pretty basic, actually. Um, does highly technical language, such as legalese or medical jargon, change as quickly uh, as colloquial language? And um, if so, in your, in your research, have you found it easier or um, even possible to standardize that content as opposed to humor and other things like uh, intoxicado, as you mentioned early on in your presentation? That type of terminology tends to evolve even more quickly. It depends on the field, but you know, I recently was at a conference for the World Bank, and I was mentioning that the standard rate of productivity for translators for decades, you know, since I entered the profession at least, was always 2,500 words per day. And the translators from the World Bank told me, well, our you know, guideline is about 2,000 words per day because we have to translate all kinds of new ter financial terminology that's being invented on the fly, and new program names, new offices that are being created in different countries and things like that. So it really depends on the field, but that kind of terminology does really represent a challenge for translators because many times they are inventing the terms in, an, in another language. So it takes a lot of research. It takes, you know, how can I come up with the perfect word for this that's gonna be used from now on 
by this official government body like the World Bank. So that kind of terminology, you know, in some fields, and it depends on the language as well, because some languages have pretty strict rules about new terminology entering the language, at least in written form. And they tend to be a little bit less responsive to what people are actually using on the ground if they have all those kinds of bodies dictating what people can and can't say. So you can kind of tell what side I'm on when it comes to <laughs> those kinds of organizations. But it, it depends on many factors, but the short answer is that the specialized groups tend to evolve their specialized areas more quickly. Um, in, in the course of looking at uh, scenarios for c companies that have several target languages, mm -hmm. did you look into any interest in simplified or pivot English as an uh, intermediate step? And mm -hmm. uh, can you comment on that? Yeah. Well, we haven't looked specifically at pivot English, or pivot, simplified English, but we have looked at English as a pivot language. So for those of you who are not familiar, what's happening is, because the volume of translation has been increasing for a lot of languages, and the translation profession has not evolved that quickly in some countries, China is one example, India is another, what's happening is a lot of companies have to translate into English first and then into Chinese. So there aren't enough translators between, say, Italian and Chinese. So they're going Italian into English, English in, into Chinese. And this is happening for other languages as well. So yes, we have looked at that, and it's problematic for many reasons. One, the cost of doing that is twice as expensive. And second, the quality degrades when you have to trans translate a translation. So that is a concern. We've written quite a bit about that, and um, it is a problem. But what we've written about is that the fields, the professions, are not maturing fast enough. They're not keeping up. And it's a, it's a difficult problem, because in markets like China, when I talk to companies in China, they tell me, well, if I find someone who has good enough English to be a translator, or good enough German or French, they go and specialize in international business, where they can make more money. And some translation agencies in China actually told me that they can't keep translators long enough because some of them will work for a few months, they make enough money that they go on vacation for a couple months, and then they never come back, and then they go work for a different agency. So, and others, you know, are saying that they can't find enough talent that's willing to work for the wages that they, that they can offer because their, sta their standards are higher and their customers expect better quality. So it is a real challenge. Um, we're seeing that for many different languages around the world. Hey. Hey. Can you share with us the most interesting or surprising reaction you've had to your book? <laughs> you know, that's a good question. Um, I think the most surprising reaction I've had, well, there's a few things that, there are a few that come to mind. Um, I think the most interesting thing was speaking at the Jimmy Carter Library, and a lot of people came to that who had no background in translation whatsoever. In fact, it's kind of a treat for me to speak to people who actually deal with translation, understand a lot about translation. Um, in that group, in most of the public uh, talks and signings that I've been doing, a lot of people are coming just from the general public, people in the bookstore who just wander over. And you know, I think that's really exciting. It has been surprising for me how many people are interested in the topic. And you know, one person actually told me that they found a copy of my book in in a Barnes and Noble in Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> and that really made me happy because I think the message that we need to get out is to all the people who don't work in languages and all the people who are monolingual and don't know a thing about other languages, if they can start to take an interest and start to see that translation affects their lives, I think there will be a lot more support for the industry. You know, in, in writing this book, our big goal was to really make it like Freakonomics for translation. You know, take a topic that people think is dry and boring and not really uh, doesn't really affect me, and to make it fun and exciting and and make it seem real and make it seem like it affects their lives because it does. <laughs> so, I don't have any um, real shockers, but <laughs> that's that's pretty much my impression so far. Thank you. Well, that, that reminds me. Uh not a surprise, but I, I noticed uh, one of your most recent tweets that you got a thank you letter from President Carter and, and Rosalind uh, for your nice memories of them in the book. So yes, was the, that was a, that was well. I guess that was a shock. Yes, <laughs> that was my big shock. I'm still a little shaking when I think about that. I didn't expect to receive a, a letter from President Carter himself. 
Um, I did a whole talk at the library about what he had done throughout his administration, his short time before he was uh, involuntarily retired, as he puts it. <laughs> and um, you know, he actually did a lot for language access and did a lot for the deaf community in the United States and a lot for court interpreting and lots of different areas of language access. So. Well, he's a nice man. His mom was nice, too, Ms. Lillian. Aw. <laughs> uh, hey, thank you for your talk. Uh, you already addressed this somewhat, but uh, I have a question. Uh, do you know Duolingo? Uh, Duolingo is, uh, is uh, a new technology. It's very, very innovative. Like it combines language learning and like crowdsourced translation. Do you think this kind of um, new technologies can change how translation is done? Well. You know, I have not seen, uh, not talked with the developers of Duolingo personally, but I have been watching what they're doing. And, you know, all of us on the research team at Common Sense Advisor are constantly taking briefings from technology vendors and tracking what's going on with products like Duolingo. And I think it's interesting. You know, I think it, it's interesting what they're doing. And a lot of companies are doing very interesting things right now. What I think is even more interesting than what they're doing with their technology is the fact that they are getting funding for some of these things. So we're starting to see a lot of high-tech startups that are get attracting interest from investors and venture capital. And I think that is very interesting because I haven't really seen the business case being proved for a lot of these things yet. But what I'm interested in is the fact that this is raising awareness in society at large. So Ashton Kutcher is a backer of Duolingo and Tim Ferriss. And you know we wrote a post recently on our blog about all the celebrities that are backing translation technologies. You know, Gene Simmons from KISS is a backer of Ortsbo. And many people don't realize that Bono has uh, interest in a company called SDI Media, which some of you might be familiar with, with if you work in uh, film and, and gaming, and they do a lot of the mul multilingual subtitling and voiceover. So, you know, this kind of interest from high-profile names and venture capital and actually seeing some real money come into the industry is, I think, of great interest. And I'll be very interested to see if those investors actually make a profit and and uh, to see what happens. Um, this particular model, you know, a hybrid of language learning and translation is interesting. I, you know, have, have been monitoring what's happening and we'll see. Um, you know, I try to be open-minded when it comes to any new innovation like this because you know, we are independent and you know, we kind of have to stand back and see what's happening from a broader market perspective. So we can't be tied to any you know, old-fashioned ways of doing things. We're always looking at, okay, what are the newest trends and how is this going to shake up the industry? So we'll see what happens with, with Duolingo. There's certainly a lot of buzz about it. They're doing a good job with marketing. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, your... Your discussion about the Beyonce picture illustrated very interestingly the, the amount of context required to understand something. Do you have any analogous examples from your Schwar poetry translation as to what kind of you know contextual differences would need to be explained? Oh, too many to list. I mean, her culture is so different from the one that I grew up in. And um, there's a single word in her language that actually means the song that is emitted through the fragrance of a plant the song that is emitted through the fragrance of a plant. And I have to think about it every time I say it because it still confuses me. Um, so that's in one of her poems. And I had to figure out how on earth to render that into English without destroying the lyrical quality of the poem. <laughs> so I went with, you know, s you know, went around with sacred song and all these different things. And, you know, it just doesn't convey it. So we ended up putting an asterisk and an explanation at the bottom <laughs> because the only way to give the full context to the reader. But yeah, there are many like that. But we don't even have to go to a language like Schwar to come up with examples like that. You know, there are tons of examples like this in, in, um, in all kinds of languages, even languages like Spanish. You know, there are words, you know, we have a whole example in the book of words for brown in Spanish. And it depends on if you're describing a bear or an animal or eyes or hair, you know, what word do you use for brown? You know, and people have asked me, does that mean that people who speak Spanish see shades of brown that other people don't see? <laughs> Maybe that's one of the weirdest questions that I got, Mary. <laughs> but, um, you know, it is fascinating to think about all of these different concepts that we have that are, even in languages that are not linguistically that, 
that distant from each other. Uh, thank you very much for the, the talk. I had one question when you were explaining uh, how much power the translators have, especially for uh, translators at the UN or who translate for political issues. Um, I was wondering if there were any ways for uh, citizens to uh, find out afterwards if the translators had any doubt or any, you know, uh, we're wondering, like here, I wasn't really sure, uh, yeah, and this could lead to, you know, a potential, uh, yeah, uh, so I was wondering what were the tools available for that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's very hard. There are tons of examples that we mentioned in the book, and I'll give you uh, one famous one. Um, the words, we will bury you, that were spoken by Nikita Khrushchev, uh, were seen as a threat, and people thought that he literally meant, we want to kill you, we want to bury you with a nuclear attack. And the phrase that he was using actually was a more common phrase at that time in Russian that meant something like, we will be here even when you are gone, we will outlast you. Um, you know, and people have asked me, well, are you sure that's really what that meant? And you know, I've given them examples of things we say in English, like, he came in dead last, or, oh, you're killing me when someone's making you laugh. If you think about how we translate those things, you know, <laughs> they could have a similar impact if they were mistranslated. As for how to go back and find out if the, that's exactly what someone said, it's a really hard thing because you've probably seen in the media, even in recent times, when a mistranslation is out there, that's the story. You know, what that person said, that is pretty much the story that is in the news. And it's very hard, even when they issue a correction, to go back and change it. And you know, once it's reached the public, it's really too late to go out. Not a, you know, the public isn't going to be interested in a story about a mistranslation. So it's unfortunately a lot of what we hear in the news is affected by the translator's skills and by the interpreter's skills. So we have a lot of examples of that in the book. And you know, I, I was asked the other day, well, do you have any examples of people who mistranslated those things on purpose? <laughs> And I'm not, you know, I'm not able to go and interview the exact, you know, maybe that's another book. <laughs> but um, certainly, you know, we have, we have plenty of examples of that. And I don't think that most of those have been done on purpose. I think the job of the interpreter is just so difficult that a lot of times <coughs> interpreters make mistakes. And so that's often the result when we see some of those things in the news. Hi, Natalie. Thank you very much, and welcome to the Bay, and congratulations on the publication. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process of collecting the, the stories and how, the decision-making of what to include and what not, and also whether this book is, uh, is going to be translated? <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to Talia to come up with two really great questions. Um, so, as for how we chose the stories to include in the book, um, it was very important that we picked stories that would reflect a range of human emotions. So we were careful to make sure that we didn't have too many tearjerkers and too many funny mistranslations. We wanted to hit every emotion that we could. We also wanted to hit every part of life that we could. You know, So we had stories about translation of sacred texts and religion because we wanted pe people to see how translation affects their spiritual life. But we also have translate you know stories about translation in mundane topics and things like mac cosmetics and um harlequin romance novels and hallmark cards and nescafe and you know all of these kinds of things you know products that people use every day so we really did try to pick a range of topics that would hit many different areas of life you know and we also looked at kind of the common things that people like to read about. And even in the newspaper, you know, the sports section, the food section, the politics section, you know, um, current events, um, lifestyle, arts, entertainment, those kinds of things. So we tried to hit on, you know, basically every aspect of life, as many as we could. You know, I wanted to include a section on science, but that didn't seem that interesting to the average reader. <laughs> um, but we tried to include as many as we possibly could. As for whether or not the book will be translated, um, I've had lots of volunteers because I have lots of friends who are translators. Um, this is really a question of the publisher and publishing rights and how that all works. So basically, if a publisher in another country wants to publish the book in another language, they have to buy the foreign rights from Penguin USA, 
which is the original publisher, and then they can commission a translation in that, in that language for that country. So I actually don't have much control over that, but what I do know is the more popular it is in the home market where it's launched, usually the more interest there is in doing translated versions in other countries. So my hope is that that will happen, but I also think it's going to be a hard book to translate because there's a lot of humor in it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, Dagmar Dolachko with Peritos Language Services. Thank you for this beautiful book. This is great. We need to get the word out more about our profession. But I have a question which maybe you can answer because of your, all your insights with Common Sense Advisory. With this increasing amount of volume, we're, we're just buried, <laughs> to use your word, in content, and the ever-increasing price pressure, where do you see quality going in translation? And that people still understand, like in any other profession, they will get what they pay for. <laughs> yes. Well, we did a study um, in 2008 on quality and how buyers define quality. And one of the very interesting things that we found was that quality was defined slightly differently depending on who was buying. And so buyers in the retail sector, for example, told us, you know, it doesn't matter to us if the product name is spelled wrong or, you know, even if the description has a typo, but if the numbers are wrong, we have a major problem. Because if we've advertised that that product is on sale for one ninety nine ninety nine, and they get a decimal point wrong or they get a number wrong, we are out millions of dollars. So for them, the way they define quality was accuracy of numbers. So that was in the retail sector. In sectors like life sciences, of course, every single thing has to be perfect. There has to be no room for mistranslations because human lives are on the line. And in the automotive sector, you know, it depends on the type of content, of course, but for some things like user-generated content, of course, and certain help content, it was viewed as acceptable to use machine translation and to have, you know, some disclaimer that this is not perfect translation and that if you need a perfect translation, contact us. You know, and if they get a certain number of inquiries, they would start to uh, pay for professional translation of that with a human involved. But the, no the notion of quality because a lot of times vendors of translation services will talk about quality as if it's just this one big thing that can be defined. And our research shows that it's much more nuanced than that and that there are certain purposes for which different levels of quality are acceptable. And we've actually gone to the trouble of defining you know, different levels of quality for different content types in, in some of our research. So the answer is quality depends on who's doing the buying. Mm. I'm interested uh, to follow up on what you said about not everybody should be a translator, even if he or she speaks multiple languages. So who should be a translator, and what characteristics does that person need to make uh, that successful? Mm -hmm. Well, the reasons that translators or would be professional translators and interpreters fail exams are different depending on if we're talking about translation or interpreting. But for, from an interpreting perspective, because that's uh, I have actually graded exams for interpreting, I can say that the reason that they typically fail is because they haven't worked enough on interpreting skills. So memory length, you know, being able to remember the information and transfer the information without losing information, you know, or transforming it, because that's another thing that sometimes interpreters will accidentally just change the meaning or forget something or they mishear something. They don't comprehend properly and so they say something different than what was actually said. So that's the reason that people fail a lot of those exams. A lot of it is lack of preparation, lack of training, um, and lack of practice, lack of skills. Not everybody has the skills and has the ability to retain large segments of information and transfer them. And some people simply lack the language proficiency because you might be fluent in a lang you know, in two languages, but that doesn't mean that you can be, for example, a court interpreter. You know, if I ask you to say arraignment in another language, even if you speak that language, you can talk to your f friends and family, you might not know how to say arraignment in that other language. So part of it is lack of terminology knowledge and specialized terminology in particular. So that's the reason that a lot of interpreters fail exams. In the case of translation, it's quite similar. Um, Sometimes it's making mistakes with transferring meaning. Sometimes it's not knowing how to use the appropriate resources to research terminology and not knowing how to apply uh, tools or use tools in the case of some exams, depending on who's doing the, the testing. 
So there are a lot of reasons why translators and interpreters will fail, but I would say the biggest reason is because they overestimate their level of ability to manipulate the language and to really go deep in terms of terminology and in terms of understanding in a specialized area. Well, thank you, Natalie. Thank um, you. Thank you.